act one of alu laria or the concealed treasure by titus Maccius plautus translated by henry thomas riley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dramatis personae the household god who speaks the prologue read by todd euclio an aged athenian read by greg giordano megadorus uncle of lyconides read by algy pug lyconides a young athenian read by inco strobilus servant to megadorus and lyconides read by alan mapstone Catholicus, servant of megadorus read by kerry evans your book voice anthrax cook read by todd congrio cook read by rapanzalina eunomia the sister of megadorus read by christine g phaedra the daughter of euclio read by sandra Stephila, an old woman, servant of Euclio, read by Sonia. Slave, read by Todd. Stage directions, read by Jim Locke. Scene, Athens before the houses of Euclio and Megadorus and the Temple of Faith. The prologue spoken by the household god lest any one should wonder who i am i will tell you in a few words i am the household god of this family from whose house you have seen me coming forth it is now many years that i have been occupying this house and i inhabited it for the father and the grandfather of this person who now dwells here but beseeching me his grandfather entrusted to me a treasure of gold unknown to all he deposited it in the midst of the hearth praying me that i would watch it for him he when he died was of such an avaricious disposition that he would never disclose it to his own son and preferred rather to leave him in want than to show that treasure to that son he left him no large quantity of land on which to live with great laboriousness and in wretchedness. When he died who had entrusted that gold to me, I began to take notice whether his son would anyhow pay greater honor to me than his father had paid to me. But he was in the habit of venerating me still less and less by very much, and gave me a still less share of devotion so in return was it done by me and he likewise ended his life he left this person who now dwells here his son of the same disposition as his father and grandfather were he has an only daughter she is always every day making offerings to me either with incense or wine or something or other she presents me too with chaplets out of regard for her i have caused this euclio to find this treasure in order that he might more readily give her in marriage if he should wish for a young man of very high rank has ravished her this young man knows who it is that he has ravished she knows him not nor yet does her father know that she has been ravished this day i shall cause the old gentleman here our neighbor to ask her as his wife that will i do for this reason that he may the more easily marry her who has ravished her and this old gentleman who shall ask her as his wife the same is the uncle of that young man who debauched her in the night-time at the festival of ceres 
but this old fellow was now making an uproar in the house, as usual. He is thrusting the old woman out of doors, that she may not be privy to the secret. I suppose he wants to look at the gold, if it be not stolen. Act One, Scene One, Enter Euclio, Driving Out, Staphyla. Get out, I say, be off, get out. By my troth, you must budge out of this house here, you pry about woman, with your inquisitive eyes. Pray, why are you beating me, wretched creature that I am? That you may be wretched, and that, cursed as you are, you may pass a cursed life, well befitting you. But for what reason have you now pushed me out of the house? Am I to be giving you a reason, you whole harvest of whips? Get away there from the door. There, do look, if you please, how she does creep along. But do you know how matters stand with you? If I just now take a stick or a whip in my hand, I'll quicken that tortoise pace for you. Oh, that the gods would drive me to hang myself, rather indeed than that I should be a slave in your house on these terms. Hark, how the hag is grumbling to herself. By my troth, you wretch, I'll knock out those eyes of yours, that you mayn't be able to watch me, what business I'm about. Get out! Pushes her with his hands. Further yet, still further further there now stand you there by my faith if you budge a finger's breadth or a nail's width from that spot or if you look back until i shall order you in faith i'll give you up at once as a trainer for the gibbet aside i know for sure that i did never see one more accursed than this hag and i'm sadly in fear of her lest she should be cheating me unawares, or be scenting it out where the gold is concealed. A most vile wretch, who has eyes in the back of her head as well. Now I'll go and see whether the gold is just as I concealed it. That so troubles wretched me in very many ways. He goes into his house. Scene 2 Staphyla alone. By heavens, I cannot now conceive what misfortune, or what insanity, I am to say has befallen my master. In such a way does he often, ten times in one day, in this fashion, push wretched me out of the house. I faith, I know not what craziness does possess this man. Whole nights is he on the watch, then, too, all the day long does he sit for whole days together at home, like a lame cobbler. Nor can I imagine now by what means to conceal the disgrace of my master's daughter, whose lying in approach is near. And there isn't anything better for me, as I fancy, than to make one long capital letter of myself, when I've tied up my neck in a halter. Scene 3 Enter Euclio from his house. Euclio to himself. And now, with my mind at ease, at length I go out of my house, after I've seen that everything is safe indoors. To Staphyla. Now do you return at once into the house, and keep watch indoors keep watch indoors upon nothing at all forsooth or is it that no one may carry the house away for here in our house there's nothing else for thieves to gain so filled is it with emptiness and cobwebs tis a wonder that for your sake jupiter doesn't now make me a king philip or a darius you hag of hags i choose those cobwebs to be watched for me I am poor, I confess it. I put up with it. With the gods send, I endure. Go indoors, shut to the door. I shall be there directly. Take you care not to let any strange person into the house. 
What if any person asks for fire? I wish it to be put out, that there may be no cause for any one asking it of you. But if the fire shall be kept in, you yourself shall be forthwith extinguished. Then do you say that the water has run out, if any one asks for it? The knife, the hatchet, the pestle and mortar, utensils that neighbors are always asking the loan of. Say that the thieves have come and carried them off. In fact, in my absence, I wish no one to be admitted into my house. And this, too, do I tell you beforehand. If good luck should come, don't you admit her. If, Faith, she takes good care, I think, not to be admitted. For though close at hand, she has never come to our house. Hold your tongue and go indoors. I'll hold my tongue and be off. Shut the door, please, with both bolts. I shall be there directly. Staffler goes into the house. I'm tormented in my mind, because I must go away from my house. In faith, I go but very unwillingly, but I know full well what I'm about, for the person that is our master of our ward has given notice that he will distribute a didricum of silver to each man. If I relinquish that, and only ask for it, at once I fancy that all will be suspecting that I've got gold at home, for it isn't very likely that a poor man would despise ever such a trifle, so as not to ask for his piece of money. For as it is, while I am carefully concealing it from all, lest they should know, all seem to know it, and all salute me more civilly than they formerly used to salute me. They come up to me, they stop, they shake hands, they ask me how I am, what I'm doing, what business I'm about. Now I'll go there whither I had set out. Afterwards, I'll betake myself back again home as fast as ever I can. End of Act One Act Two of Alu Lauria, or the Concealed Treasure, by Titus Machius Plautus, translated by Henry Thomas Riley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One. Enter Eunomia and Megadorus from their house i could wish you brother to think that i utter these words by reason of my own regard and your welfare as is befitting your own sister to do although i am not unaware that we women are accounted troublesome for we are all of us deservedly considered very talkative and in fact they say at the present day that not a single woman has been found dumb in any age still brother do you consider this one circumstance, that I am your nearest relation, and you, in like manner, are mine? How proper is it that I should counsel and advise you, and you me, as to what we may judge for the interest of each of us, and for it not to be kept concealed or kept silence upon through apprehension, but rather that I should make you my confidant, and you me in like manner? For that reason, now, have I brought you here apart, out of doors, that I might hear discourse with you upon your private concerns. Best of women, give me your hand. Takes her hand, Eunomia, looking about. Where is she? Who, pray, is this best of women? Yourself. Do you say so? If you say no, I say no. Indeed, it's right that the truth should be spoken. For the best of women can nowhere be found. One is only worse than another, brother. I think the same, and I'm determined never to contradict you on that point, sister. What do you wish? Give me your attention, I beg of you. Tis at your service. Use and command me, please, if you wish for aught. 
a thing I consider very greatly for your advantage, I'm come to recommend you. Sister, you are doing after your usual manner. I wish it were done. What is it, sister? That you may enjoy everlasting blessings in being the father of children. May the gods so grant it. I wish you to bring home a wife. Ha! Ah, I'm undone. How so? Because, sister, your words are knocking out the brains of unfortunate me. You are speaking stones. Well, we'll do this that your sister requests you. If she requests me, I will do it. Tis for your own interest. Yes, for me to die before I marry. Let her who comes here to-morrow be carried out of the house the day after, sister. On that condition give me her whom you wish to give. Get ready the nuptials. I am able, brother, to provide you with a wife, with a very large marriage portion. But she's somewhat aged. She's of the middle age of woman. If you request me, brother, to ask for her, I'll ask her. Would you like me to ask you a question? Yes, if you like, ask it. Suppose any old man, past mid-age, brings home a middle-aged wife, if, by chance, he should have a child by this old woman, do you doubt at all but that the name of that child is posthumous, or prepared? Now, sister, I will remove and lessen this labour for you. I, by the merits of the gods, and of my forefathers, am rich enough. These high families, naughty pride, bountiful portions, acclamations, imperiousness, vehicles inlaid with ivory, superb mantles, and purple, I can't abide, things that by their extravagance reduce men to slavery. Tell me, pray, who is she whom you would like to take for a wife? I'll tell you. Do you know that Euclio, the poor old man, close by? I know him. Not a bad sort of man, I faith. I'd like his maiden daughter to be promised me in marriage. Don't make any words about it, sister. I know what you were going to say, that she's poor. This poor girl pleases me. May the gods prosper it. I hope the same. What do you want me now for? Do you wish for anything? Farewell. And you the same, brother. Goes into the house. I'll go meet Euclio, if he's at home. But see, the very person is betaking himself home, whence I know not. Scene two. Enter Euclio. Euclio to himself. My mind had a presentiment that I was going to no purpose when I left my house, and therefore I went unwillingly, for neither did any one of the wardsmen come, nor yet the master of the ward, who ought to have distributed the money. Now I am making all haste to hasten home, for I myself am here, my mind's at home. Megadorus accosting him. May you be well and ever fortunate, Euclio. May the gods bless you, Megadorus. How are you? Are you quite well, and as you wish? Euclio aside. It isn't for nothing when a rich man accosts a poor man courteously. Now this fellow knows that I've got some gold. For that reason he salutes me more courteously. Do you say that you are well? Uh, troth, I'm not very well in the money line. If faith, if you've a contented mind, you have enough to be passing a good life with. Euclio aside. By my faith, the old woman has made a discovery to him about the gold. Tis clear it's all out. I'll cut out her tongue and tear out her eyes when I get home. Why are you talking to yourself? I'm lamenting my poverty. I've a grown-up girl without a portion, and one that can't be disposed of in marriage. Nor have I the ability to marry her to anybody. Hold your peace. Be of good courage, Euclio. 
she shall be given in marriage. You shall be assisted by myself. Say, if you have need of aught, command me. Eucleo aside. Now is he aiming at my property, while he's making promises? He's gaping for my gold, that he may devour it. In the one hand he is carrying a stone, while he shows the bread in the other. I trust no person who, rich himself, is exceedingly courteous to a poor man. When he extends his hand with a kind air, then he is loading you with some damage. I know these polypi who, when they've touched a thing, hold it fast. Give me your attention, Eucleo, for a little time. I wish to address you in a few words about a common concern of yours and mine. Eucleo aside. Alas, woe is me! My gold has been grabbed from indoors. Now he's wishing for this thing, I'm sure to come to a compromise with me. But I'll go look in my house. He goes towards his door. Where are you going? I'll return to you directly, for there's something I must go and see to at home. He goes into his house. By my truth, I do believe that when I make mention of his daughter, for him to promise her to me, he'll suppose that he's being laughed at by me. Nor is there out of the whole class of paupers one more beggarly than he. Eucleo returns from his house. Eucleo aside. The gods do favor me. My property's all safe. If nothing's lost, it's safe. I was very dreadfully afraid before I went indoors. I was almost dead. I'm come back to you, Megadorus, if you wish to say anything to me. I return you thanks. I beg that, as to what I shall inquire of you, you'll not hesitate to speak out boldly. So long, indeed, as you inquire nothing that I may choose to speak out upon. Tell me, of what sort of family do you consider me to be sprung? Of a good one. What think you as to my character? Tis a good one. What of my conduct? neither bad nor dishonest do you know my years i know that they are plentiful just like your money i faith for sure i really did always take you to be a citizen without any evil guile and now i think you so eucleo aside he smells the gold what do you want with me now since you know me, and I know you, what sort of person you are, a thing that may it bring a blessing on myself, and you and your daughter, I ask your daughter as my wife. Promise me that it shall be so. Heyday, Megadorus, you are doing a deed that's not becoming to your usual actions, and laughing at me, a poor man, and guiltless toward yourself and toward your family for neither in act nor in words have i ever deserved it of you that you should do what you are now doing by my truth i neither am come to laugh at you nor am i laughing at you nor do i think you deserving of it why then do you ask for my daughter for yourself that through me it may be better for you and through you and yours for me. This suggests itself to my mind, Megadorus, that you are a wealthy man, a man of rank, that I likewise am a person, the poorest of the poor. Now, if I should give my daughter in marriage to you, it suggests itself to my mind that you are the ox, and that I am the ass when I am yoked to you. And when I'm not able to bear the burden equally with yourself, I, the ass, must lie down in the mire. You, the ox, 
would regard me no more than if I had never been born, and I should both find you unjust, and my own class would laugh at me. In neither direction should I have a fixed stall. If there should be any separation, the asses would tear me with their teeth, the oxen would butt at me with their horns. This is the great hazard in my passing over from the asses to the oxen. The nearer you can unite yourself in alliance with the virtuous, so much the better. Do you receive this proposal, listen to me, and promise her to me? But indeed, there is no marriage portion. You are to give none. So long as she comes with good principles, she is sufficiently portioned. I say so for this reason, that you mayn't be supposing that I have found any treasures. I know that. Don't enlarge upon it. Promise her to me. So be it. Starts and looks about. But, oh, Jupiter, am I not utterly undone? What's the matter with you? What was it sounded just now as though it were iron? Here, at my place, I ordered them to dig up the garden. Euclid runs off into his house. But where is this man? He's off, and he hasn't fully answered me. He treats me with contempt. Because he sees that I wish for his friendship, he acts after the manner of mankind. For if a wealthy person goes to ask a favour of a poorer one, the poor man is afraid to treat with him. Through his apprehension he hurts his own interest. The same person, when his opportunity is lost, too late, then wishes for it. Eucleo coming out of the house, addressing Staphyla within. By the powers, if I don't give you up to have your tongue cut out by the roots, I order and I authorize you to hand me over to any one you please to be incapacitated. By my troth, Eucleo, I perceive that you consider me a fit man for you to make sport of in my old age for no deserts of my own. In faith, Megadorus, I am not doing so, nor should I desire it, had I the means. How now? Do you then betroth your daughter to me? On those terms, and with that portion which I mentioned to you. Do you promise her, then? I do promise her. May the gods bestow their blessings on it. May the gods so do. Take you care of this, and remember that we've agreed that my daughter is not to bring you any portion. I remember it. But I understand what fashion you, of your class, are wont to equivocate. An agreement is no agreement. No agreement is an agreement, just as it pleases you. I'll have no misunderstanding with you. But what reason is there why we shouldn't have the nuptials this day? Why, by my troth, there is a very good reason for them. I'll go, then, and prepare matters. Do you want me in any way? That shall be done. Fare you well. Megadorus, going to the door of his house, and calling out, Hello! Strobilius, follow me quickly, in all haste to the flesh market. Exit Megadorus. He has gone hence. Immortal gods, I do beseech you. How powerful is gold! I do believe now that he has had some intimation that I've got a treasure at home. He's gaping for that. For the sake of that has he persisted in this alliance. Scene 3. Eucleo alone. Eucleo going to the door of his house. He opens it and calls to Staphylo within. Where are you who have now been blabbing to all my neighbors that I'm going to give a portion to my daughter? Hello, Stephella, I'm calling you. Don't you hear? Make haste indoors there, and wash the vessels clean. 
I have promised my daughter in marriage. Today I shall give her to be married to Megadorus here. Enter Staphyla from the house. Staphyla, as she enters. May the gods bestow their blessings on it, but in faith it cannot be. Tis too sudden. Hold your tongue and be off. Take care that things are ready when I return home from the forum, and shut the house up. I shall be here directly. Exit. What now am I to do? Now is ruin near at hand for us, both for myself and my master's daughter, for her disgrace and her delivery are upon the very point of becoming known. That which even until now has been concealed and kept secret cannot be so now. <sighs> I'll go indoors that what my master ordered may be done when he comes. But by my faith, I do fear that I shall have to drink of a mixture of bitterness. Exit. End of Act Two Act Three of Arl Lu Lauria, or The Concealed Treasure, by Titus Machius Plotus, translated by henry thomas riley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org act three scene one enter strobilus anthrax and congrio with music girls and persons carrying provisions after my master had bought the provisions and hired the cooks and these music girls in the market-place he ordered me to divide these provisions into two parts by my troth but you really shan't be dividing me i tell you plainly if you wish me to go anywhere hall i'll do my best a very pretty and modest fellow indeed as if when you are a conger by name you wouldn't like to be cut into pieces but anthrax i said that in another sense and not in the one which you were pretending now my master is going to be married to-day whose daughter is he to marry the daughter of this eucleo his near neighbour here for that reason he has ordered half of these provisions here to be presented to him one cook and one music girl likewise that is you take one half to him the other half home tis just as you say how's that couldn't this old fellow provide from his own resources for the wedding of his daughter for what's the matter what's the matter do you ask a pumice stone isn't so dry as this old fella do you really say that it is as you affirm do be judge yourself why he's forever crying out for aid from gods and men that his property is gone and that he is ruined root and branch if the smoke by chance escapes out of doors through the rafters of his house why when he goes to sleep he ties a bag beneath his gullet why so that when he sleeps he may lose no breath and does he stop up the lower part of his windpipe as well lest perchance he should lose any breath as he sleeps in that tis fair that you should credit me as it is for me to credit you why really i do believe you but further do you know how it is he faith he grieves to throw away the water when he washes do you think a great talent might be begged of this old fellow for him to give us through which we might become free by my troth if you were to ask it he would never let you have the loan of hunger why the other day the barber had cut his nails he collected all the parings and carried them off if faith 
You do describe a miserably stingy wretch. But do you think that he does live so very stingily and wretchedly? A kite the other day carried off his morsel of food. The fellow went crying to the praetor. There, weeping and lamenting, he began to request that he might be allowed to compel the kite to give bail. There are innumerable other things that I could mention if I had the leisure. But which of you two is the sharper? Tell me. I, as being much the better one. A cook I ask for, not a thief. As a cook, I mean. Strobilus to Anthrax. Oh, what do you say? I'm just as you see me. He's a nine-day cook. Every ninth day he's in the habit of going out to cook. You, you three-lettered fellow, do you abuse me, you thief? To be sure I do, you trebly distilled thief of thieves. Now do you hold your tongue for the present, and that lamb, whichever is the fatter of the two? Very well. Do you, Congrio, take that and go indoors there? Pointing to Euclio's house. And? To a music girl and some of the people with provisions. Do you follow him? The rest of you, this way, to our house. By my troth, you've made an unfair division. They've got the fattest lamb. But the fattest music girl shall be given you then. Do you, therefore, go along with him, Phrygia? And do you, Elusium, step indoors here to our house? Oh, you crafty troublous, have you pushed me off here upon this most miserly old fellow, where if I ask for anything, I may ask even to hoarseness before anything's found me? Tis very foolish, and tis thanklessly done, to do a service to you, when what you do goes for nothing. But how so? Do you ask? In the first place, then, there will be no confusion for you there in the house. If you want anything to use, bring it from your own home. Don't lose your trouble asking for it. But here in our house there's great confusion and a large establishment. Furniture, gold, garments, silver, vessels. If anything's lost here, and I know that you can easily keep hands off if nothing's in your way, they may say... The cooks have stolen it, seize them, bind them, beat them, thrust them in the dungeon. Nothing of that sort will happen to you, inasmuch as there will be nothing for you to steal. Follow me this way. I follow. Strobilus knocking at the door of Euclid's house. Oh, there's Staphila. Come out and open the door. Staphila, from within. Who calls there? Strobilus. Scene two. Enter Staphila. What do you want? For you to take in these cooks, and this music girl, and these provisions for the wedding. Megadorus bade me take these things to Euclio. Are you about to make this wedding, Strobilus, in honour of Ceres? Why? Because I don't see any wine brought. Why, that will be brought just now, when he himself comes back from the market. There's no firewood here in our house. There are the beams. A faith, there are. There is wood, then. 
Don't you be seeking it out of doors. What? You unpurified fellow! Although your business is with the fire, for the sake of a dinner or of your own hire, do you request us to set our house on fire? I don't ask you. Take them indoors. Follow me. They follow her indoors, and Strobilus goes with the others into the house of Megadorus. Scene three. Enter Pythodocus from the house of Megadorus. Mind you, your business. I'll step in and see what the cooks are doing, to observe whom, in faith, today it is a most laborious task. Unless I manage this one thing, for them to cook the dinner down in the dungeon, thence, when cooked, we might bring it up again in small baskets. But if they should eat below, whatever they should cook, those above would go without their dinner, and those below have dined. But here am I, chattering as though I had no business, when there's such a pack of thieves in the house. Goes into the house. Scene four. Enter Eucleo with some chaplets of flowers in his hand. I wished at length to screw up my courage to-day, so as to enjoy myself at the wedding of my daughter. I come to the market. I inquire about fish. They tell me that it is dear, that lamb is dear, beef is dear, veal, large fish, and pork, all of them are dear. And for this reason, were they still dearer, I hadn't the money. I came away thence in a rage, since I had nothing wherewithal to make a purchase, and thus did I balk all those rascals. Then I began to think with myself upon the road. If you are guilty of any extravagance on a festive day, you may be wanting on a common day, unless you are saving. After I disclosed this reasoning to my heart and appetite, my mind came over to my opinion that I ought to give my daughter in marriage at as little expense as possible. Now I've bought a bit of frankincense and these chaplets of flowers. These shall be placed upon the hearth for our household god, that he may grant a propitious marriage to my daughter. But what do I? Do I behold my house open? There's a noise, too, within. Is it that I am robbed? Wretch that I am! Congrio speaking within the house. Sick of the neighbors, a bigger pot if you can. This one's too little, it can't hold it. Woe to me! By my faith, I'm a dead man. The gold's being carried off. My pot's being looked for. I'm certainly murdered. Unless I make haste to run with all haste indoors here. Apollo, prithee do assist and help me, whom thou hast already, before this, helped in such circumstances. Pierce with thine arrows the plunderers of my treasure. But am I delaying to run before I perish outright? He runs into his house. Scene five. Enter Anthrax from the house of Megadorus. Anthrax speaking to some within. Dromo, do you scale the fish? Do you, Macario, have the conger and the lamprey boned? I'm going to ask the loan of a baking pan of our neighbor Congrio. You, if you are wise, will have that capon more smoothly picked for me than is a plucked play actor. But what's this clamor that's arising here hard by? By my faith, the cooks, I do believe, are at their usual pranks. I'll run indoors, lest there may be any disturbance here for me as well. Retreats into the house of Megadorus. Scene six. Enter Congrio in haste from the house of Eucleo. 
congrio roaring out beloved fellow-citizens fellow-countrymen inhabitants neighbors and all strangers do make way for me to escape make all the streets clear never have i at any time until this day come to beckons in a bacchanalian den to cook so sadly have they mauled wretched me and my scullions with their sticks i am aching all over and am utterly done for that old fellow has so made a bruising school of me and in such a fashion has he turned us all out of the house myself and them laden with sticks nowhere in all the world have i ever seen wood dealt out more plentifully alack a day by my faith to my misery i'm done for the bacchanalian den is opening here he comes he's following us i know the thing i'll do that the master himself has taught me scene seven enter eucleo from his house driving the cooks and the music girl before him eucleo calling out while congrio and the others are running off come back where are you rushing to now hold you why are you crying out you stupid because this instant i shall give your name to the triumvirs why because you've got a knife tis the proper thing for a cook why did you threaten me i think that it was badly managed that i didn't pierce your side with it there's not a person that's living this day a greater rascal than you nor one to whom designedly i would with greater pleasure cause a mischief in faith though you should hold your noise really that's quite clear the thing itself is its own witness as it is i'm made softer by far with your sticks than any ballet dancer but what right have you to touch us you beggar man what's the matter do you even ask me is it that i've done less than i ought to have done only let me is going to strike him now by my faith at your great peril if this head should feel it troth i don't know what may happen hereafter your head feels it just now but what business pray had you in my house in my absence unless i had ordered you i want to know that hold your noise then because we came to cook for the wedding why the plague do you trouble yourself whether i eat meat raw or cooked unless you are my tutor i want to know if you will allow or not allow us to cook the dinner here i too want to know whether my property will be safe in my house i only wish to carry the things away safe that i brought here i don't care for yours should i be coveting your things i understand don't teach me i know what is it on account of which you now hinder us from cooking the dinner here what have we done what have we said to you otherwise than you could wish do you even ask me you rascally fellow you who've been making a thoroughfare of every corner of my house and the place is under lock and key if you had stopped by the fireside where it was your business you wouldn't have had your head broken it has been done for you deservedly therefore that you may now know my determination if you come nearer to the door here unless i order you i'll make you to be the most wretched of creatures do you now know my determination he goes into his house where are you going come you back again so may laverna love me well i'll expose you at once with loud abuse here before the house if you don't order my utensils to be restored to me what shall i do now verily by my faith i came here with unlucky auspices i was hired for a diadrum i stand in more need now of a surgeon than of wages scene eight enter eucleo from his house with the pot of money under his cloak 
eucleo to himself as he enters this by my faith wherever i shall go really shall be with me and with myself will i carry it nor will i ever again entrust it to that place for it to be in such great peril speaking to congrio and his scullions now then go you all of you in the house cooks and music girls introduce even if you like a whole company of hirelings cook bustle and hurry now at once just as much as you please oh dear i'm a ruined man be off your labour was hired here not your talk hark ye old gentleman for the beating by my faith i shall demand of you a recompense i was hired a while ago to cook and not to be basted proceed against me at law don't be troublesome either cook the dinner or away with you from the house to downright perdition go there yourself then congrio and the cooks and music girl go back into the house scene nine eucleo alone he's gone immortal gods a poor man who begins to have dealings or business with an opulent one commences upon a rash undertaking thus for instance megadorus who has pretended that for the sake of honouring me he sends these cooks hither is plaguing unfortunate me in every way for this reason has he sent them that they might purloin this putting his hand on the pot from unfortunate me just as i might expect even my dunghill cock indoors that was bought with the old woman's savings had well nigh been the ruin of me where this was buried he began to scratch there all around about with his claws but need of more words so exasperated were my feelings i took a stick and knocked off the head of the cock a thief caught in the act in faith i do believe that the cooks had promised a reward to the cock if you should discover it i took the opportunity out of their hands however what need of many words i had a regular battle with the dunghill cock but see my neighbour megadorus is coming from the forum i can't then venture to pass by him but i must stop and speak to him he retires close to his door scene ten enter megadorus at a distance megadorus to himself i've communicated to many friends my designs about the proposal they speak in high terms of the daughter of eucleo they say that it was discreetly done and with great prudence but in my opinion indeed if the other richer men were to do the same so as to take home as their wives without dower the daughters of the poorer persons both the state would become much more united and we should meet with less ill-feeling than we now meet with both they the wives would stand in fear of punishment more than they do stand in fear of it and we husbands should be at less expense than we now are in the greater part of the people this is a most just way of thinking in the smaller portion there is an objection among the avaricious whose avaricious minds and insatiate dispositions there is neither law nor magistrate to be able to put a check upon but a person may say this how are these rich women with portions to marry if this law is laid down for the poor let them marry whom they please so long as the dowry isn't their companion if this were so done the women would acquire for themselves better manners for them to bring in place of dowry than they now bring i'd make mules which exceed horses in price to become cheaper than gallic geldings eucleo aside so may the gods favour me i listen to him with delight very shrewdly has he discoursed on the side of economy megadorus to himself no wife should then be saying 
Indeed, I brought you a marriage portion far greater than was your own wealth. Why, it really is fair that purple and gold should be found for me, maid servants, mules, muleteers, and lackeys, pages to carry compliments, vehicles in which I may be carried. Euclio, aside. How thoroughly he does understand the doings of the wives. I wish he were made prefect of the manners of the women. Megadorus to himself. Now, go where you will, you may see more carriages among the houses than in the country when you go to a farmhouse. But this is even light in comparison with when they ask for their allowance. There stands the scourer, the embroiderer, the goldsmith, the woolen manufacturer, retail dealers in figured skirts, dealers in women's underclothing, dyers in flame colour, dyers in violet, dyers in wax colour, or else sleeve-makers or perfumers, wholesale linen-drapers, shoemakers, squatting cobblers, slipper-makers, sandal-makers stand there, stainers in mellow colour stand there, hairdressers make their demands, botchers their demands, bodice-makers stand there, makers of kirtles take their stand. Now you would think them got rid of, these make way, others make their demands. Three hundred duns are standing in your hall. Weavers, lace-makers, cabinet-makers are introduced. The money's paid them. You would think them got rid of by this, when dyers in saffron colours come sneaking along, or else there's always some horrid plague or other which is demanding something. Euclio, aside. I would accost him, if I didn't fear that he would cease to descant upon the ways of women. For the present, I'll leave him as he is. When the money has been paid to all the knick-knack mongers for these saffron-coloured garments and stomachers, your wife's expenses, then at the last comes the tax-gatherer and asks for money. You go, your account is being made up with your banker. The tax-gatherer waits, half-starved, and thinks the money will be paid. When the account has been made up with the banker, even already is the husband himself in debt to the banker, and the hopes of the tax-gatherer are postponed to another day. These, and many others, are the inconveniences and intolerable expenses of great portions. But she who is without portion is in the power of her husband. The portioned ones overwhelm their husbands with loss and ruin. But see, here's my connection by marriage before the house. How do you do, Euclio? With very great pleasure have I listened to your discourse. Did you hear me? Everything from the beginning. Megadorus, eyeing him from head to foot. Still, in my way of thinking, indeed, you would be acting a little more becomingly, if you were more tidy at the wedding of your daughter. Those who have display according to their circumstances, and splendor according to their means. Remember themselves, from whence they are sprung, neither by myself, Megadorus, nor by any poor man, are better circumstances enjoyed than appearances warrant. Surely they are. And may the gods, I hope, make them so to be, and more and more may they prosper that which you now possess. You, Cleo, aside. That expression don't please me, which you now possess. He knows that I've got this as well as I do myself. The old woman has discovered it to him. Why do you separate yourself thus alone, apart from the Senate? Troth. I was considering whether I should accuse you deservedly. What's the matter? Do you ask me what's the matter? You, who have filled every corner in my house, for wretched me with thieves? You, who have introduced into my dwelling five hundred cooks with six hands apiece, of the race of Geryons whom were Argus to watch, who was eyes all over? 
that juno once set as a spy upon jupiter he never could watch them a music girl besides who could alone drink up for me the corinthian fountain of pyrene if it were flowing with wine and then as to provisions truth there's enough for a procurer even i sent as much as a lamb then which lamb i indeed know right well that there is nowhere a more curious beast existing i wish to know of you why is this lamb curious because it's all skin and bone so lean is it with care why even when alive by the light of the sun you may look at its entails it's just as transparent as a punic lantern i bought it to be killed then it's best that you likewise should bargain for it to be carried out for burial for i believe it's dead by this time euclio i wish this day to have a drinking with you by my troth i really must not drink but i'll order one cask of old wine to be brought from my house in faith i won't have it for i've determined to drink water i'll have you well drenched this day if i live you who have determined to drink water euclio aside i know what plan he's upon he's aiming at this method to overcome me with wine and after that to change the settlement of what i possess i'll take care of that for i'll hide it somewhere out of doors i'll make him lose his wine and his trouble together unless you want me for anything i'm going to bathe that i may sacrifice he goes into his house by my faith you pot taking it from under his cloak you surely have many enemies and that gold as well which is entrusted to you now this is the best thing to be done by me to take you away my pot to the temple of faith where i'll hide you carefully faith thou dost know me and i thee please do have a care not to change thy name against me if i entrust this to thee faith i'll come to thee relying on thy fidelity he goes into the temple of faith end of act three act four of alu lauria or the concealed treasure by titus Machius plautus translated by henry thomas riley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org act four scene one enter strobilus this is the duty of a good servant to do what i'm intending not to consider the commands of his master a bore or to trouble him for that servant who resolves to serve his master with hearty good will him it behoves to act expeditiously for his master slowly for himself but if he sleeps let him so sleep as to bethink himself that he is a servant but he who lives in servitude to one in love as i am serving if he sees love overcoming his master this i think to be the duty of the servant to restrain him for his safety not to impel him onwards towards his own inclination just as a float of bulrushes is placed beneath boys who are learning to swim by means of which they may labour less so as to swim more easily and move their hands in the same way do i consider that it is proper for the servant to be a boy to his master thus in love so as to bear him up lest he should go to the bottom and so should he learn the will of his master that his eyes should know what his mouth chooses not to speak 
what he orders he should hasten to perform more swiftly than the swift steeds he who shall have a care for these things will escape the castigation of the ox's hide nor by his own means will he ever bring the fetters to brightness now my master's in love with the daughter of this poor man euclio word has just now been brought to my master that she is given to megadorus here he has sent me here to spy out that he may be made acquainted with the things that are going on now without any suspicion i'll sit here by the sacred altar from this spot i shall be able in this direction and that to witness what they are about he sits by the altar and on seeing euclio hides behind it scene to enter euclio from the temple o oh, goddess faith do thou but take care not to discover to any person that my gold is there i have no fear that any one will find it so well is it concealed in its hiding place by my troth he will surely have a charming booty there if any one shall meet with that pot loaded with gold but i entreat thee faith to hinder that now i shall go wash me that i may perform the sacrifice so that i may not delay my new connection by marriage but that when he sends to me he may forthwith take my daughter home over and over again how goddess faith do thou take care that i shall carry away the pot safe from thy temple to thy fidelity have i entrusted the gold in thy grove and temple is it placed goes into his house strobilus coming from behind the altar he mortal gods what a deed did i hear this person speaking of how that he had hidden here in the temple of faith a pot filled with gold prithee beware you how you are more faithful to him than to myself and he as i fancy is the father of her whom my master's in love with i'll go hence to it i'll thoroughly ransack the temple to see if i can anywhere find the gold while he's engaged but if i do find it o oh goddess faith i'll offer to thee a gallon jug full of honeyed wine that i'll surely offer to thee but i'll drink it up myself when i have offered it retreats behind the altar scene three enter euclio from his house euclio to himself wasn't for nothing that the raven was just now croaking on my left hand he was both scratching the ground with his feet and croaking with his voice at once my heart began to jump about and to leap within my breast but why do i delay to run he discovers strobilus and drags him from behind the altar out out you earthworm who have this instant crept out of the earth who just now were nowhere seen and now that you are seen shall die for it by my faith you juggler i'll receive you now after a disagreeable fashion begins to shake and beat him oh what the cursed plague doth ail you what business have you with me old fellow why do you torment me why are you dragging me for what reason are you beating me you out and out whipping post you even ask that you not thief but thrice dotted thief what have i stolen from you 
give me that back here, if you please. What do you want me to give you back? Do you ask me that? As for me, I've taken nothing away from you. Give up that which you have taken away for yourself. Are you going to do so? Do what? You can't carry it off. What do you want? Lay it down. Troth, for my part, I think that you are in the habit of quizzing, old gentleman. Put that down, please. Cease your quibbling. I'm not trifling now. What am I to put down? Why don't you mention it, whatever it is, by its own name? By my faith, I really have neither taken nor touched anything. Show me your hands here. Well, I do show them. See, here they are. Holding out his hands. I see them. Come, show me the third as well. Strobilus aside. Sprites and frenzy and madness possess this old fellow. Are you doing me an injustice or not? A very great one, I confess, and as much as you are not strung up, and that too shall be done this moment, unless you do confess. What am I to confess to you? What it was you took away hence. May the gods confound me if I've taken away anything of yours. Aside. And if I don't wish I had taken it away. Come then, shake out your cloak. At your pleasure. Shakes it. You haven't it among your underclothing? Search where you please. Pshaw! How civilly the rascal speaks, that I may suppose he has taken it away. I know your tricks. Come, show me here again that right hand. Here it is. Extending it. Now show me your left. Well, then, I show you both, in fact. Extending them. Now I leave off searching. Give back that here. Give back what? Are you trifling with me? You certainly have got it. I got it? Got what? I shan't say you want to hear. Whatever you have of mine, give it back. You are mad. You've searched me all over at your own pleasure, and yet you've found nothing of yours in my possession. Eucleo starting. Stop, stop. Who was that? Who was the other that was within here, together with yourself? Troth, I'm undone. He is now rummaging about within. If I let this one go, he'll escape. At last, I have now searched this one all over. He has got nothing. Be off where you please. Jupiter and the gods confound you. He returns his thanks not amiss. I'll go in here now, and I'll at once throttle this accomplice of yours. Will you not fly hence from my sight? Will you away from here, or no? I'm off. Take you care, please, how I see you. He goes into the temple. Scene 4. Strobilus Alone I would rather that I were dead outright by a shocking death than not lay an ambush this day for that old fellow. But he'll not venture now to hide his gold here. He'll now be carrying it with him, I guess, and be changing the spot. But hark, there's a noise at the door. Looking in the direction of the temple. See, the old fellow's bringing out the gold with him. Meanwhile, I'll step aside here to the door. Conceals himself near the door. Scene 5. Enter Eucleo from the temple with the pot of money. 
euclio to himself i had thought that there was the very greatest dependence upon faith very nearly had she played me a pretty trick if the raven hadn't come to my assistance to my sorrow i should have been undone troth i very much wish that raven would come to me which gave me the warning that i might say something kind to him for i would as soon give him something to eat as lose it now i'm thinking of a lonely spot where i shall hide this the grove of sylvanus outside of the wall is unfrequented and planted with many a willow there will i choose a spot i am determined to trust sylvanus rather than faith exit strobilus reappearing from his hiding-place capital capital the gods will me to be safe and preserved now will i run before to that place and climb up into some tree and thence will i watch where the old fellow hides the gold although my master bade me remain here i'm resolved rather to risk a mishap along with emolument exit scene six enter lyconides and eunomia from the house of megadorus i've told you all mother as well as i do myself you understand all about the daughter of eucleo now i do entreat you my mother make mention of it to my uncle and i now unask of you mother that which before i entreated of you to conceal this from megadorus you know yourself that what you desire to be done i desire and i trust that i shall obtain this of my brother and the reason is good if to so as you say that in a drunken fit you debauched this damsel could i my mother tell a falsehood in your presence phaedra cries out in labour in eucleo's house Oh, oh, I die, my nurse. Oh, my pangs are coming on. I entreat thee for thy protection, Juno Lucina. Oh, oh. Ah, my mother, I see a more convincing proof for you. She's crying aloud. She's in the pangs of labour. Come indoors here, with me, my son, to my brother, that I may obtain a grant from him of that which you beg of me. Go, I'll follow you this instant, mother. Eunomia goes into the house. But my servant, Strobilus, I wonder where he is. Am my order to wait here for me? Now I reflect with myself if he's lending me his assistance. It isn't fair that I should be angry with him? I'll go indoors where they are sitting in judgment upon my life. Goes into the house of Megadorus. End of Act 4《Act V of Alu Laria, or the Concealed Treasure, by Titus Machius Plautus, translated by Henry Thomas Riley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act V, Scene One. Enter Strobilus with the pot of money i by myself exceed the riches of the griffins who inhabit the golden mountains for i'm unwilling to make mention of those other kings beggarly fellows i am the king philip oh charming day for when i went from here just now i arrived there much the first and long before i place myself in a tree and thence observe where the old fellow hid the gold when he departed thence i let myself down from the tree and dug up the pot full of gold thence from that spot i saw the old fellow betaking himself back again he didn't see me for i turned a little on one side out of the path heyday here he comes himself i'll go and hide this away at home goes into the house of megadorus 
scene two enter eucleo tearing his hair and wringing his hands i'm ruined i'm done for i'm murdered whither shall i run whither not run stop him stop him whom who i don't know i see nothing i'm going blindfold and in fact whether i am going or where i am or who i am i can't in my mind find out for certain to the audience i beseech you give me your aid i beg and entreat of you and point me out the person that has taken it away what's the matter why do you laugh i'm acquainted with you all i know that there are many thieves here who conceal themselves with white clothes and chalk and sit as though they were honest to one of the spectators but say you you i am resolved to believe for i perceive even by your looks that you are honest oh then none of these has got it you've been the death of me tell me then who has got it you don't know oh wretched wretched me i'm done for woefully undone in most sorry plight i go so much groaning and misfortune and sorrow has this day brought upon me hunger and poverty too i'm the most utterly ruined of all men upon the earth for what need of life have i who have lost so much gold that i so carefully watched i pinched myself and my inclinations and my very heart now others are rejoicing at this my loss and my misfortune i cannot endure it <laughs> he runs about crying and stamping scene three enter lyconides from the house of megadorus what person i wonder is this before our house lamenting and that utters complaints with his moaning why surely this is euclid as i imagine i am utterly undone the thing's all out he knows now as i suppose that his daughter is brought to bed i am in a state of uncertainty now what i shall do let her go or remain accost him or fly what person is it that speaks there tis i wretch that i am yes and so am i and wretchedly ruined whose lot is misfortune so great and sorrow be of good courage how prithee can i be so because that deed which is afflicting your mind i did it and i confess it what is it i hear from you that which is the truth what evil young man have i deserved by reason of which you should do thus and go to ruin both me and my children a divinity was my prompter he prompted me to do it how i confess that i have done wrong and i know that i deserve censure for that reason i have come to beseech you that with feelings assuaged you will pardon me why did you dare do so to touch that which was not your own what do you wish to be done the thing has been done it can't be undone i believe that the gods willed it for if they hadn't willed it i know it wouldn't have happened but i believe that the gods have willed that i should be the death of you in fetters don't say that what business then have you to touch what is my own against my will because i did it under the evil influence of wine and love most audacious man that you should dare to come here to me with that speech you impudent fellow for if this is lawful so that you may be able to excuse it let us openly in broad daylight plunder their golden trinkets from ladies after that if we are caught let us excuse ourselves that we did it when intoxicated by reason of being in love too cheap are wine and love if one in liquor and in love is allowed to do with impunity whatever he pleases but i come to you of my own accord to supplicate you on account of my folly persons don't please me who when they've done wrong excuse themselves you knew that you had no right there 
you oughtn't to have touched. Therefore, inasmuch as I did dare to touch, I make no objection to keep by all means. You keep what is my own against my will? Against your will I do not ask, but I think that that which was yours ought to be mine. Moreover, you, Cleo, you'll find, I say, that mine it ought to be. Now really, on my word, I'll drag you to the praetor and take proceedings against you, unless you make restitution. Make restitution of what to you? What you've stolen of mine. I? Stolen of yours? Whence or what is it? So shall Jupiter love you, how ignorant you are about it. Unless, indeed, you tell me what you're inquiring for. The pot of gold, I say. I'm asking back of you, but you confessed to me that you had taken away. By my faith, I've neither said so, nor have I done it. Do you deny it? Yes, I do utterly deny it, for neither the gold nor yet this pot, what it means, do I know or understand. Give me up that pot which you took away from the word of Sylvanus. Come, give it me back. I would rather give you the one half of it. Though you are a thief to me, I'll not be hard upon the thief. Give it me back. You are not in your senses to call me a thief. I thought, Euclio, that you would come to the knowledge of another matter as concerns myself. It is a great matter which I wish to speak with you upon at your leisure, if you are at leisure. Tell me, in good faith, have you not stolen that gold? In good faith? No. Nor know who has taken it away in good faith no to that as well but if you should know who has taken it away will you discover it to me i will do so nor accept of a share from him whoever he is for yourself nor harbor the thief even so what if you deceive me then may great jupiter do unto me what he pleases I'm satisfied. Come then, say what you wish. If you know me but imperfectly of what family I'm born, Megadorus here is my uncle, and Antimachus was my father, my name is Lycanides, Eunomia is my mother. I know the family. Now, what do you want? I want to know this. You have a daughter of yours. Why, yes, she's there at home. You have, I think, recently betrothed her to my uncle? You have the whole matter. He has now bade me announce to you his refusal of her. A refusal? When the things are got ready, and the weddings prepared? May all the immortal gods and goddesses confound him, so far as is possible, by reason of whom this day, unhappy wretch that I am, I have lost so much gold. Be of good heart and speak in kindly terms. Now, a thing... May it turn out well and prosperously to you and your daughter. May the gods so grant, say. May the gods so grant. And for me too, may the gods so grant it. Now, then, do you listen? The man that admits a fault is not so much to be despised if he feels a sense of shame when he excuses himself. Now you, Cleo, I do beseech you, that which unawares I have done wrong towards yourself or your daughter, you will grant me pardon for the same and give her for a wife to me, as the laws demand. I confess that I did violence to your daughter on the festival of Ceres, by reason of wine and the impulse of youth. Woe is me! What shocking deed do I hear of you? Why do you exclaim, you, whom I have made to be a grandfather now at the very wedding of your daughter, if your daughter has just been brought to bed in the ninth month after, calculate the number, for that reason, in my behalf, has my uncle sent his refusal. Go indoors, Inquire whether it is so or not, as I say. I'm undone utterly. So very many fortunates unite themselves for my undoing. I'll go indoors that I may know what of this is true. He goes into his house. I'll follow you this instant. This matter seems now to be pretty nearly in the haven of safety. Now, where to say my servant Strobilus is, I don't know. But yet I'll wait here still a little while. After that I'll follow this man indoors. Now, in the meantime, I'll give him leisure to inquire of the nurse about my doings, the intendant of his daughter, whether she knows the truth. Moves 
as if going scene four enter strobilus at a distance strobilus to himself immortal gods with what and how great delights do you present me i've got a four-pound pot filled with gold who there is richer than i what man is there greater than i at athens now any one i mean to whom the gods are propitious lycanides to himself why surely i seem to stand to hear the voice of someone speaking here strobilus to himself ah do i not see my master lycanides to himself do i see strobilus now my servant tis he himself tis no other i'll accost him i'll step out towards him i do think that he has been as i requested him to the old woman the nurse herself of this damsel why don't i tell him that i found this prize and speak out for that reason i'll beg him to make me free i'll go and speak to him addressing him i found what have you found not that which the boys cry out they've found in the bean are you trifling with me than as you are in the habit of doing he turns as if to go away master stop i'll speak out then do listen come then tell me i found to-day master very great riches where pray a four-pound pot i say full of gold what crime is this that i hear of from you i've stolen it from this old fellow euclio where is this gold in my box at home now i wish to be made free i make you free you fellow brimful of wickedness out upon you master i know what you would be at troth i've cleverly tried your inclination you were just getting ready to take it away from me what would you do if i had found it you can't make good your pretenses come give up the gold i give up the gold give it up i say that it may be given back to him where am i to get it from that which you have confessed just now to be in your box e faith i'm in the habit of talking nonsense twas in that way i was speaking lycanides seizing him but do you know what he won't kill me outright e faith you shall never get it hence of me the pot belonging to the old fellow which i've not got i will have it whether you will or not when i've tied you up all fours and torn asunder your body for you're tied up to the beam but why do i delay to rush upon the jaws of this rascal and why this instant do i not compel his soul to take its journey before its time are you going to give it to me or not i will give it to you i want you to give it to me now and not at a future time i'll give it to you now but i entreat you to allow me to recover breath lycanides lets him go what is it you want me to give you master don't you know you rascal and do you dare to refuse me the four pound pot full of gold which you just now said you had stolen calling at the door hello there where now are the flogging men master do hear a few words i won't hear floggers hello there hello scene five enter two flogging slaves what's the matter i want the chains to be got ready listen to me i beg of you afterwards order them to bind me as much as you please i will hear you but hasten the matter very quickly if you order me to be tortured to death see what you obtain in the first place you have the death of your slave then what you wish for you cannot get 
but if you had only allured me by the reward of dear liberty you would already have obtained your wish nature produces all men free and by nature all desire freedom slavery is worse than every evil than every calamity and he whom jupiter hates him he first makes a slave you speak not unwisely now then hear the rest our age has produced masters too grasping who i'm in the habit of calling harpagos harpies and tantali poor amid great wealth and thirsty in the midst of the waters of ocean no riches are enough for them not those of midas nor of croesus not all the wealth of the persians can satisfy their tartarian maw masters use their slaves rigorously and slaves now obey their masters but tardily so on neither side is that done which would be fair to be done their provisions kitchens and store cellars have a vicious old fellow shut up with a thousand keys slaves thievish double dealers and artful open for themselves things shut up with a thousand keys which the owners hardly like to be granted to their lawful children and stealthily do they carry off consume and lick them up fellows that will never disclose their hundred thefts even at the gibbet thus in laughter and joking do bad slaves take revenge upon their slavery so then i come to the conclusion that liberality renders slaves faithful rightly indeed have you spoken but not in a few words as you promised me but if i do make you free will you give me back what i'm asking for i will give it back but i wish for witnesses to be present you'll pardon me master if i trust you but a little just as you please let there be present even a hundred then i shouldn't care about it strobulus going to the door of the house of megadorus megadorus and you pneumonia please come here i beg of you the business finished you shall return directly scene six enter megadorus and eunomia who's calling us ha lycanides ha strobulus what is the matter say tis a short matter what is it i'm calling you as witnesses if i bring here a four pound pot full of gold and give it up to lycanides lycanides makes me a free man and orders me to be my own master to lycanides do you promise me so i do promise so have you heard now what he has said we have heard swear then by jupiter alas to what i am reduced by the misfortunes of others you are too insulting still i'll do what he bids me hark you our generation hasn't much confidence in people the documents are signed the twelve witnesses are present the registrar writes down the time and the place and still the pleader is found to deny that it has been done but release me speedily please here take this stone giving him a stone if i knowingly deceive you so may jupiter reject from me his blessings the city and citadel safe as i do this stone he throws it have i now satisfied you i am satisfied and i'm going to bring the gold 
Go with the speed of Pegasus and return devouring the road with your rapid steps. Exit Strobilus. Any impertinent slave that wishes to be more wise than his master is a nuisance to a decent man. Let the Strobilus be off as a free man to utter perdition. If he only brings me the pot full of pure gold, so that I may restore the Euclid, my father-in-law, from his grief to joy, and obtain the favour of his daughter, who is just brought to bed by reason of my debauching her. But see, Strobilus is returning loaded. As I guess, he's bringing the pot. And, for sure, it is the pot that he's carrying. Scene 7. Enter Strobilus, carrying the pot of gold. Lyconides, I bring you my findings that I promised. The four-pound pot of gold. Have I been long? Why, yes. He takes some of the gold out of the pot. Oh, mortal gods, what do I behold? Or what is it I hold? More than six hundred Philippian pieces? Three or four times over? But let's call out Euclid forthwith. Scene 8. Lyconides going to the door of Euclid's house. Ho! Oh, Euclid! 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 Euclid opening his window. What the matter? Come down to us, for the gods will you be saved. We've got the pot. Have you got it? Or are you trifling with me? We've got it, I say. Now if you can, fly down hither. Euclid, having come out of the house to them. O great Jupiter, O household divinity, and Queen Juno, and Alcides, my treasurer, that at length you do show pity upon a wretched old man. Taking the pot in his arms. Oh, my pot, oh, how aged I, your friend, do clasp you with joyful arms, and receive you with kisses, with a thousand embraces, even I cannot be satisfied. Oh, my hope, my heart, that dissipates my grief. Lycanides, aside to Megadorus. I was thought that to be in want of gold was the worst thing for both boys and men, and all old people. Indigence compels boys to be guilty of misdeeds, men to thieve, and old men themselves to become beggars. But tis much worse, as I now see, to abound in gold beyond what's necessary for us. Alas! What miseries has Euclid endured on account of the pot that a little while since was lost to him? To whom shall I give deserved thanks? Whether to the gods, who shall regard for good men, or to my friends, upright men, or to them both? Rather to both, I think, and first to you, Lycanides, the origin and author of so great a good. You do I present with this pot of gold. Accept it with pleasure. I wish it to be your own, and my daughter as well, in the presence of Megadorus and his good sister, Eunomia. Lycanides, receiving the pot of gold. The favor is received, and is returned, in thanks, as you deserve, Euclid, a father-in-law most acceptable to me. I shall think the favor sufficiently returned to me, if you now receive with pleasure my gift, and myself as well, for your father-in-law. I do receive it, and I wish my house to be that of Euclid. What still remains, master? Remember now that I am to be free. You well put me in mind. Be you a free man, O Strobulus, for your deserts, and now prepare indoors the dinner that has been so disturbed. Strobilus coming forward. Spectators, the avaricious Euclio has changed his nature. He has suddenly become liberal. So, too, do you practice liberality. And if the play has pleased you well, loudly clap your hands. End of Act 5 End of Alu Lauria or the Concealed Treasure by Titus Machius Plautus, translated by Henry Thomas Riley.